morning. So good to have each and every one of you uh, here with us again this morning as we continue our study in the Gospel of Luke. Uh, this morning we're going to study chapters 20 and 21. So if you would grab your Bible uh, off the shelf or from where laying there next to you and open it up to Luke chapter 20, verse number 1. And that's where we'll begin in just a moment. But as we always do, we want to begin with a a word of prayer. And I will lead you in prayer, but I I ask that you would go ahead and as I lead you, go ahead and and raise up to God the concerns that are on your heart. Uh, Asking God to help with anything that might be troubling you this morning. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father, we praise your name. We thank you, Lord, for... Uh, another day, another opportunity that you've given us as, as believers in you to, to open your, your holy word together, to allow you, Lord, to speak to us from your, your timeless scriptures that, that you have given us, Lord, uh, and preserved for us miraculously down through the centuries. Lord, guide our hearts, help us to understand these, these verses. Lord, help us to understand how to apply these things in our lives for your glory and your honor. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. All righty. Following Jesus' triumphal entry into Jerusalem on the final week before his crucifixion, all three synoptic gospel writers agree that Jesus went straight to the temple. However, Mark's narrative relates a few more details. Mark tells us that after Jesus' triumphal entry into Jerusalem, he went to the temple and he looked around, observing the conditions at the end of the day there in the temple. Now remember, this is the first day of the Feast of Unleavened Bread. That day is when thousands, if not tens of thousands of people were coming into Jerusalem from every road that came into town. And so the temple was, the following six days was going to be absolutely jam-packed with people coming specifically for the Feast of Unleavened Bread and then for Passover that came at the end of that week. And in Mark's narrative, he tells us that that Jesus came to the temple right after entering into Jerusalem that Sunday, but then he returned to Bethany and spent the night, and then on the following morning, Jesus and his disciples return to Jerusalem and to the temple. We see that in Mark 11, verses 11 through 17. Now if we come to Luke 19, 45 through 48, Luke tells us that Jesus entered the temple and he began to drive out those who were selling, saying to them, It is written, and my house shall be a house of prayer but you have made it a robber's den. And he was teaching them daily in the temple. But the chief priests and the scribes and the leading men among the people were trying to destroy him. And they could not find anything that they might do, for all the people were hanging on every word that Jesus said. Now as we come down to chapter 20, verse number 1, it reads, On one of the days while he was teaching the people in the temple and preaching the gospel, the chief priests and the scribes with the elders confronted him. And they spoke, saying to him, Tell us by what authority you are doing these things, and who is the one who gave you this authority? Jesus answered and said to them, I will ask you a question, and you tell me. Was the baptism of John from heaven or from men? And they reasoned among themselves, saying, If we say from heaven, 
he will say, why did you not believe him? But if we say, for men, all the people will stone us to death, for they are convinced that John was a prophet. So they answered that they did not know where it came from. And Jesus said to them, Now I tell you by what authority, I'm sorry, nor will I tell you by what authority I do these things. So Jesus said, if you won't answer by what authority John the Baptist did things, then I will not tell you under what authority I do the things that I do. So these chief priests and the scribes with the elders were likely much more upset about what Jesus had done to the temple on the preceding day than their question shows. The chief priests and the elders had been the leaders of the Jewish religious establishment for the past 1,000 plus years. And they were not happy at all about this suddenly very popular rabbi who was coming in and radically demanding changes to their ways of doing things in and around the temple. The scribes in Jerusalem were the experts. The scribes were the experts in scriptural law, and they were consultants to the Sanhedrin. They were, in effect, scriptural lawyers. Now the Pharisees, which we've heard a lot about in the book of Luke, who were also there at that time coming for the Feast of Unleavened Bread and the Passover, they were likely just kind of hanging in the background. They were the religious party of the common people. They depended upon their popularity with the people of this crowd who had come with Jesus into into Jerusalem for Passover. And they were dependent upon the people as their source of authority. For this reason, the Pharisees were were very happy to be cautious about publicly berating Jesus, especially with the chief priests and the scribes and the elders standing right there with him in the temple. Now, both groups were noticing that in, in verse chapter 19, verse 48, the people in the temple were hanging on every word that Jesus said. And with this, his bold entry into their world, Jerusalem and the temple, the chief priests and the scribes and the elders were now incensed by Jesus and what he was saying and doing. They were well-educated and held the traditional leadership positions in the Sanhedrin and in the temple. They had the political influence and the power to take immediate action against Jesus. We see that in chapter 19, verse 47. They were actively trying to destroy Jesus, and they had the power to do that. Now, There was some rivalry and vying for power also between the Pharisees and the chief priests and the scribes. So the Pharisees were at this point listening as the chief priests and the scribes with the elders as they demanded to know by what authority Jesus was doing these things or who was the one who gave Jesus this authority. Now, rephrased in modern vernacular, they might have said today, just who in the world do you think you are coming into Jerusalem and the temple and doing these things? In verse 4, Jesus, being God in the flesh, was infinitely wiser than even the most intelligent of these men. And he simply asked, in return, was the baptism of John from heaven or from men? And then in verses 5 through 6, they 
kind of huddled up and they reason among themselves saying, if we say from heaven, he will say, why did you not believe him? But if we say from men, all the people are going to try to stone us for they were convinced that John was a prophet. Jesus worked under the, exactly the same authority as the baptism of John. That of the Lord God. In verse 7, of course the chief priests and the scribes and with the elders did not want to admit or even imply that fact. So they answered that they did not know where it came from. They were likely envious of the tremendous popularity of John the Baptist, just like they were envious of Jesus. Now in verse 8, So Jesus said back to them, Nor will I tell you by what authority I do these things. The chief priests, the scribes, and the elders were part of, of a long-standing problem in Israel. Instead of leading the people to serve the Lord God with sincerity and faithfulness, these leaders abused their positions to gain personal power, prestige, privilege, and prosperity. With the following parable, Jesus charged them with malfeasance and misuse of their stewardship to God for the things of the temple and of the Holy Scriptures. Let's come down now to Luke 20, verses 9 through 12. Jesus spoke a parable here which offered a strong response to the challenges voiced by these leaders of Israel against His authority. Let's look at this parable really closely. Verse number 9 to begin. And He began to tell the people this parable. A man planted a vineyard and rented it out to vine growers and went away on a long journey, a, long, a journey that lasted a long time. When the Jewish leaders would not answer Jesus' question, he turned his attention to the people in the temple complex. And now he's speaking on their level with this parable. Jesus' story involved a man who planted a vineyard. Therefore, this man had the rights to the land as well as the grapevines and their fruit. The vineyard owner then rented the vineyard to some tenant farmers. They're called vine growers in my translation. And to these tenant farmers, the owner of the vineyard gave stewardship over his vineyard, but it only, I'm sorry, that gave stewardship of his vineyard, and then he went on this long journey. Okay, we'll come back to that. The man that's in this, in this parable represented God, and the vineyard represents Israel, the nation of Israel. This picture is reminiscent of Isaiah's prophecy in Isaiah 5, 1 through 7 in which God appears as the vine dresser who diligently works the vineyard, but it only produced wild grapes. In other words, inedible grapes. In this parable, though, of Jesus, the conflict is not between God and the vineyard or Israel, but between God and the leaders of Israel, the vine growers, who God placed as, as leaders to lead the people within the temple and, the, and God's worship within the temple and 
within the scriptures or God's written word. The man, the owner of the vineyard, went on a journey for a long time. Now, <laughs> Israel's got a much longer history than the United States of America. Much longer, okay? It had been 2,000 plus years since God's covenant with Israel made with Abraham and then through his descendants after him. So this is the long journey that is being spoken of in the parable. Let's come to verses 10 through 12. At the harvest time, the man sent a slave to the vine growers so that they would give him some of the produce of the vineyard. But the vine growers beat him beat him and sent him away empty-handed. And then the vineyard owner proceeded to send another slave, and they beat him also and treated him shamefully and sent him away empty-handed. And he proceeded to send a third slave, and this one also they wounded and cast out. The owner of the vineyard had been away for a long time, many, many years. In the case of, of God's covenant with Israel, over 2,000 years. And the vine growers, who were completely responsible for the stewardship of the vineyard, which is Israel, had been doing this for a long, long time. And God had placed them in, in, in this position, this stewardship, for a long period of time. The owner of the vineyard, or God, trusted them to take care of, and to, of the people of Israel and to reap the harvest of the vineyard. There, there should not been, have been any need to send more than a slave, or a, as we see the slaves are prophets, from the Old Testament scriptures, it, 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 God had no need to send anyone other than a prophet to collect what was due of the owner of the vineyard, to, to make sure that, that essential course corrections were made in what was being taught of the people of Israel and to, and to see how they were doing and to, and to bring them back into line with God's will. As a representative of the landowner, the slave or prophet was sent with the authority of the landowner himself, who is God, to collect what was owed to him. Whatever the slave or the prophet said to the vine growers, the leaders of Israel, it had the same authority as the landowner God, as if he were standing there face to face and speaking to them. The slaves were simply delivering the message sent by the landowner. The landowner, or God, did not request an exorbitant amount. Only what was rightfully his, God's. Instead of responding reasonably and lawfully, the vine growers, or the leaders of Israel, beat the slave, the prophet, and treated him shamefully, and sent him away empty-handed. Their ill treatment of the slave or the prophet revealed their disrespect for the landowner or God. Like Israel's response to the prophets, the vine growers, the leaders of Israel did not believe the landowner God could or would do anything to them. They usurped a privilege and a position that was not theirs. This parable shows God's patience and long-suffering. And then he sent another slave, and they beat him also and treated him shamefully and sent him away empty-handed. And then in verse 12, he proceeded to send a third, and this one they also wounded, and they cast him out. This third slave 
represents the last of the old covenant prophets. That was John the Baptist, whom Herod Antipas had thrown into prison for many months and then had beheaded him. And these chief priests and scribes with the elders had neither acknowledged to the people that John was in fact a prophet sent from God, nor had they bitterly protested to the authorities over the people's justifiable outrage at Herod's abuse of his authority against God and God's prophet. Luke 13, 34. If we look there, we see that Jesus had previously mourned over Jerusalem because Israel killed their prophets and stoned those who were sent by God to seek their repentance. There are many examples of this. I'll give you two that you can find in Scripture. The first one is, Jewish traditions hold that King Manasseh of Judah ordered the prophet Isaiah to be sawn in two. That's that's recorded in Hebrews 11.37 in the New Testament. There was also a prophet named Zechariah, not to be confused with the one who wrote the book of Zechariah, but there was a prophet named Zechariah who was stoned to death by the people of Israel. We read that story in 2 Chronicles chapter 24 in the Old Testament. And there are many more in between. Mistreating God's servants points to a personal contempt for the Almighty God. Now the remainder of the parable given by Jesus clearly affirms His authority as coming from God. But it also predicts Jesus' death in just four days, and his subsequent vindication by God through his resurrection from the dead. Let's go to Luke 20, 13. The owner of the vineyard said, What shall I do? I will send my beloved son. Perhaps they will respect him. But when the vine growers saw him, they reasoned with one another, saying, This is the heir to the vineyard. Let us kill him, so that the inheritance will be ours. So they threw him out of the vineyard, and they killed him. What then will the owner of the vineyard do to them? Verse 16a, it says, He will come and destroy these vine growers and give the vineyard to others. Now come to verse 13 and let's kind of analyze this this second half of the parable. The owner of the vineyard, God, pondered how to respond to the continuing disrespect by his stewards, the leadership of Israel. He asked himself, what shall I do? This, now, this is a rhetorical question for us humans as we read this story. God knew exactly what he should and what he would do. This rhetorical question by God gets us to thinking and shows that he still expects the vine growers or the leaders of Israel or the leaders in his church those he has he is placed in responsibilities here on earth to do what is right according to his scriptures. Now I want to I want to just pause right there for a little moment of talking about application. The Bible also tells us that those who are over our government have been placed over our government by the Almighty God. He has placed them there 
He has placed them there in positions of authority. But what we need to understand, and they need to understand, is the Almighty God still demands that they do things according to His Scriptures, that their decisions are scripturally based and and right according to God's righteousness. Okay, now that I've gotten that off my chest, let's move on. God's goodness in this story stands in stark contrast to the wickedness of people who do not know Him. The owner of the vineyard, God, decided, I will send my beloved son. Perhaps they will respect him. The Greek word there that's used for beloved son also implies uniqueness. And it could be translated one and only son. In verse 14, this young man was the owner of the vineyard's only son. He was the one and only heir to the owner's estate. So the vine growers, the leaders of Israel, reasoned, let us kill him and the inheritance will become ours. The parables, the parallels to Jesus are obvious here. In John 1.14, it says the word of God became flesh and walked among us. In John 3.16, it tells us, For God so loved the world that He gave His one, His one and only Son, that whosoever would believe in Him would not perish, but have eternal life. At the right time, God sent His one and only Son to provide the gift of redemption from sin and death that every human needs. One singular difference separates the parable from God's purpose in sending Jesus' son. The owner in the parable thought the stewards of the vineyard might respect his son. God knew better. From the foundations of the earth, God knew the result when he sent his son. In, In contrast, God sent his son knowing that Jesus would be rejected and crucified. In fact, that is exactly why the Father sent the Son into this world, to provide in His life, His death, and His resurrection, God's full redemption from sin. Note in verse 14, the vine growers' conspiracy may have begun when they saw the son approaching the vineyard. Or, they may have reasoned with one another about it after he arrived. The simple pronoun it is contained in the original Greek text. It applies to the owner's continued demand for his share of the harvest and also what the vine growers considered to be an opportunity presented by their, the presence of the heir. They thought they could claim the inheritance if the son were dead. They didn't simply reject his father's demands, but took the son's life. Nothing, nothing, could justify their malevolent actions. Not considering how the father would respond to the death of his son, the stewards consummated their conspiracy. In verse 15, Jesus stepped outside the parable to ask his listeners a rhetorical question also. What then will the owner of the vineyard do to them? And in verse 16a, Jesus did not wait for the chief priests and the scribes with the elders to answer, but immediately told them what his father would do in response to the murder of his son. This is a prophecy. 
Listen carefully. Number one, He, God Himself, will come. No longer will surrogates deliver His messages like prophets. Number two, He, God, will destroy these vine growers. He will kill them. The grieving father will execute judgment on the ones who have killed and rejected his son. Number three, the owner, God, will give the vineyard, Israel, to others. And we see this played out in its finality in the last book of the Bible. If you look at Revelation 19 and 20, it's kind of a long read. It exactly outlines these three steps that God has taken against those who reject and killed His Son. Now let's go back to Luke chapter 20, starting in verse 16b. When they heard it, they said, May it never be. But Jesus looked at them and said, What then is this that is written? The stone which the builders rejected, this became the chief cornerstone. Everyone who falls on that stone will be broken to pieces. But on whomever it falls, it will scatter him like dust. The scribes and the chief priests tried to lay hands on Jesus that very hour. And they feared the people, for they understood that he spoke this parable against them. The Jewish religious leaders... The Jewish religious leaders... who were present showed that they understood the basic meaning of the parable with their initial response. When they heard it, they said, may it never be. That that God Himself would come, that 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 He would execute judgment on the on the vine growers that he would then give the vineyard to somebody else. They understood it. They saw and they knew what it meant when they said, may it never be. Jesus summarized the parable as as follows in verses 17 and 18. But Jesus looked at them and said, what What then is this that is written? The stone which the builders rejected, which is coming from Psalm 118, verse 22. This will will become the chief cornerstone. Verse 18, everyone who falls on that stone will be broken to pieces, but on whomever it falls, it will scatter him like dust. Looking back at verse 17, Christ Jesus is that chief cornerstone of God's redemptive plan for mankind and for the building of the kingdom of God from the redeemed who would repent and believe. Israel, the Jews of the day of Jesus, was chosen by God in His redemptive plan to bring forth the Messiah to humanity and are the people referred to as the builders who would reject their Messiah when He came to them. Verse 18, Everyone who falls on that stone will be broken to pieces. God is just, and He will vindicate His Son. But on whomever it falls, it will scatter Him like dust. means that those who oppose the Christ, who reject Him, will meet with eternal destruction. God's plan will not fail. The main point of the parable in verses 17 and 18 
was tacitly acknowledged by the reaction of the Jewish leaders who were present in the crowd of listeners. And it shows their understanding that Jesus was referring to God's coming judgment on themselves. Verse 19, the scribes and the chief priests tried to lay hands on him that very hour. And they feared the people, for they understood that he spoke this parable against them. The scribes and the chief priests and the elders then formed a conspiracy to kill Jesus. And the conspiracy began that very hour. Now let's talk a little bit about who these guys are and, and, and why they react the way they do. Okay, scribes. They are Jewish religious leaders in charge in their society with keeping and interpreting the scriptures. They were well-educated in the scriptures, went to the best schools that Jerusalem had to offer for learning the scriptures, and they were the lawyers of their culture, stewards of the scriptural laws that talked to the people how to apply the scriptures in their lives. Okay, now let's talk about the chief priests. The chief priests are headed up by the high priest. They were the Jewish leaders from the tribe of Levi who were the stewards of the temple. They were likely the ones who were particularly offended when Jesus came in and began driving the money changers out of the temple because that was a direct criticism of them and their management of the temple. Now the elders were the members of the Sanhedrin. They were the stewards of Jewish government. They were highly concerned about Jesus' triumphal entry into Jerusalem on the, on the day that the feast began, on Sunday, as the people who were coming in in, in huge crowds were proclaiming Jesus to be the Messiah, the King, the coming King. They wanted nothing more than to maintain the status quo with the Roman authorities. They had a good life. They, the, the, the scribes and the chief priests and the elders, they had life good. It was the common people who were suffering in that world under the control of the Romans. So they didn't want to ruffle the feathers of the Romans. That would not be good for them. So we come down to verses 20 through 26. And we see the formation of a deadly alliance, starting in verse 20. So they watched him and sent spies who pretended to be righteous in order that they might catch him in some statement so that they could deliver him to the rule and the authority of the governor. They questioned him saying, Teacher, we know that you speak and teach correctly, and you are not partial to any, but teach the way of God in truth. Invert, is it lawful for us to pay taxes to Caesar or not? But he detected their, tri their trickery and said to them, Show me a denarius. Whose likeness and inscription does it have? A denarius was simply a coin. And the, and the likeness and inscription it had on it was Caesar's, the emperor's. They said, Caesar's. And he said to them, Then render to Caesar the things that are Caesar's, and to God the things that are God's. And they were unable to catch him in a saying in the presence of the people, and, were, and they were amazed at his answer. And thusly they became silent. Now let's come back and let's look at this a little bit more. In verse 20, they conspired to send spies against him. Mark tells us that they conspired an alliance between some of the Pharisees and some of the Herodians. Now this is a very unusual 
group, two groups of people to come together and try to do something together. Herod the Great ruled Israel under authority of Rome from 37 B.C. to 4 B.C. And his son, Herod Archelaus, succeeded him as ruler of Judea. Now, Herod Archelaus was so inept as a king that the Romans replaced him in A.D. 6 with Herod Agrippa. Their motivation was purely economic and political. Now, the Pharisees did not like the Herodians. The Pharisees gained their power and authority from the common people that, who followed them as their leaders, their, their, their political and, and, and religious leaders. The Herodians, they weren't even considered Jews. And so the people didn't really like the Herodians, but so it's so, you see how it's so unusual for the Pharisees and the Herodians to come together and to, and to cooperate on this. The, the Herodians would not have wanted Jesus to be acclaimed Messiah as, as happened on Sunday of that week at all. So they, they didn't like what happened there just like the Pharisees did not like it. So, look at verse 20. They decided to deliver him to the rule and the authority of the governor of Rome in Palestine. This refers to the Roman governor of Judea, Pontius Pilate. The Roman law at the time gave only the Roman governor of the region the authority to render a death sentence for a crime. And in verse 20 it says, They watched him and they sent spies who pretended to be righteous in order that they might catch him in some kind of statement. Luke spoke bluntly about the motives of the religious leaders calling them spies or, or people who lie in wait might be another way to translate that. Luke was writing to an audience to whom the distinctions between the various Jewish political and religious parties might be unfamiliar. His readers, however, certainly knew... Now, now let, me, let me explain that a little bit. Luke was writing his gospel to Gentiles. Okay, Gentiles didn't know about all of, the, all of the political issues that went on inside of Israel. They, didn't, they weren't familiar with all those. But they did understand the Roman Empire, and they knew how it set up, and they knew how it governed. Okay? His readers would certainly have known of the various forms of the heavy Roman taxation system. These totaled over one-third of a person's income and included a poll tax, customs taxes, and various indirect taxes. The portrait on the coin represented to those people the authority of the current Roman government. In verses 21 through 24, they asked Jesus a question that was a lose-lose proposition. If Jesus answered yes, he would lose popularity and credibility with the people who despise the Roman occupation and its taxation. If they answered no, he would run afoul of the Roman authorities. The main Roman concern in such outlying areas of the empire was to keep the peace and to collect taxes. As long as that happened, everything went fine. But if somebody's trying to stop either one of those from happening, his life would be expendable. Now in verse 24, a denarius. This coin of the Roman Empire held two problems for a devout Jew when, when Jesus held it up. There were two problems with that coin that, such that they were against it. First of all, it was stamped with an image of a Roman Caesar or emperor who claimed to be himself God. Second, it stated that the emperor Caesar was divine. Okay, so it... Right away, the first two of the Ten Commandments in the Scriptures are violated simply by that coin having the image of Caesar who claims 
to be God. Now in verses 24 and 25, what does Jesus' response teach Christians about alliances and allegiances? We must show proper allegiances first to God, but also to the governmental authorities that God has placed over us. All things belong to God, and taxes do not undermine that truth. Governing authorities were appointed, appointed by God to keep order. And we should be loyal supporters of our country, and we should vote, and we should pay taxes, and engage in political processes up to the point where they defy Scripture. And then we can't go beyond that point. This is where our politicians of today need to understand that there needs to be a line drawn. We can't defy Scripture. We should treat our elected leaders with the respect that their positions merit, and we should pray for them, and we should, and we should, we should never turn away from God's Scriptures in what we do as believers. Okay, let's move on. There was a disagreement about resurrection that they brought up next. Now there came to him some of the Sadducees who say that there is no reg resurrection. And they questioned Jesus saying, Teacher, Moses wrote for us that if a man's brother dies, having a wife and he is childless, his brother should marry the wife and raise up children to his brother. Now there were seven brothers, and the first took a wife and died childless, and the second and the third married her, and in the same way all seven died, leaving no children. Finally, the woman died also. In the resurrection, therefore, which one's wife will she be? For all seven had married her. And Jesus said to them, The sons of this age marry and are given in marriage. But those who are considered, wor considered worthy to attain to that age and the resurrection from the dead neither marry nor are given in marriage. For they cannot even die anymore because they are like angels and are sons of God being sons of the resurrection. But that the dead are raised even Moses showed in the passage about the burning bush where he calls the Lord, the God of Abraham, and the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. Now he is not God of the dead, but of the living. For all live to him. And some of the scribes answered and said, Teacher, you have spoken well. For they did not have the courage to question him any longer about anything. Scriptural. And so, we see... That many times, when we think we've got things figured out, we don't. We, we, we think and we, and we the, come up with plans that unless we pray to God, we will not fully understand the effect of those plans. We need to give everything over to God. We should be always seeking God's will in every matter of life. And this is a powerful statement made by Jesus. And, and it's so important for us to, to bring ourselves to an understanding of that fact. Luke 20, 41 through 44. Then Jesus said to them, how is it that they say the Christ is David's son? This is tied to the idea of resurrection. For David himself says in the book of Psalms, The Lord said to my Lord, set at my right hand, until I make your enemies a footstool for your feet. Therefore David calls him Lord. How is he his son?
This is where Jesus is trying to make us understand that which is eternal versus that which is temporal like this world. God is eternal. God lives forever. God stands outside of time. And he controls all things that happen in this world. When, when he calls the Christ David's son, God sees the full picture of what's going to happen from the time of David until the coming of the Christ. The Christ is going to be the king over God's kingdom, his eternal kingdom, the kingdom that lasts forever. David was a king in Israel for a short period of time, about 40 years by earthly time. God talked to David about an eternal kingdom that would come through one who would be descended from him, who could be called his son, because God stands outside of time and sees all the events of time at the same time. And so God speaks of things that are eternal in nature, whereas we can see only things that are temporal, like our own lives. What we need to understand is that, is that we need to repent of our sinfulness. It's our sinfulness that has brought death upon us, and the reason that our bodies must be left behind, they are corrupt by sin, they must, as, as God told Adam and Eve, dust you are to dust you'll return. You're going to lay this body down and you're going to leave it behind. But you today can have eternal life. If you will place your faith in that one who brings the eternal kingdom, Jesus, the Christ, repent of your sins and give your life to Him and trust in Him and His will for your life, then you will be saved. You'll be washed clean of your sin debt and you will be given eternal life by Him. And there'll come a day when you die that, your body, that you will be resurrected and given eternal body just like the body of Jesus that was resurrected from the dead. You can make that decision today. If you, would like that, if you would like that assurance, today you can have it. If you'll just but give your life to Him. Repent and believe in the Lord Jesus Christ. Let's pray. Father, we praise Your holy name. Lord, there, there are many, many timeless to, truths that we see in this story that, that deal with living life on, on this side of the veil, on, on this side in the, in the temporal world that we live in, that, that will only last for a little while. Lord, we need to understand your timeless truths. We need to, to focus ourselves on your scriptures that were, were written according to those timeless truths and we need to learn, Lord, to repent, turn away from our sinful ways, and to be seeking always, Lord, your will, to go to you in prayer, to trust in your ways and your will to lead us through and, and, and bring us into a place of good standing and blessing by you. Lord, pray, we pray for our nation as, as we watch our, our leaders make terrible mistakes. In, in taking us in directions that your script are absolutely contrary to your scriptures. Lord, we pray for them. We ask, Lord, that each and every one of them come to know you as Lord and Savior, such that you can change them from the inside out, so that they can understand your, your righteousness as defined in scriptures, and so that they can learn to obey your righteousness, Lord. Guide us in all that we do. Lord, give us opportunity to speak about you to others. Lord, help us to give our own personal testimony of how you brought each one of us, Lord, from, from sin and death into your righteousness and eternal life. Lord, guide us in what we do. We ask, Lord, that what we do each and every day would bring honor and glory to you. 
It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.